Why is it allowed for them, but not for us? In its confrontation with the United States, Russia often employs rhetoric reminiscent of childish behavior and insecurities. But why is it allowed for them, while it's not for us? Year after year, Russian diplomats and officials conveniently pull out this propaganda cliché from the pockets at the right moment. Despite the fact that the Russian Federation has unleashed a real war in Ukraine, we still hear rhetoric from certain European and American politicians claiming that Russia is not doing anything that the United States wouldn't do in the countries where their geopolitical interests are at stake. Recently, this slogan has served as a cover for escalation. Why is it allowed for U.S. to deploy nuclear weapons in Europe, but not for us in Belarus? Stated Russian experts at the highest level following Putin's decision to deploy strategic nuclear weapons in a neighboring satellite country. Russian leadership persistently continues to accuse the West of double standards. The Kremlin tirelessly repeats that it operates using the same methods as NATO or the United States in other countries, where the spheres of influence and interest are at stake. Let's examine whether its claim holds true. Let's look at historical examples from the very recent past to see how things actually unfolded. On the night of August 2, 1990, the regular army of Iraq invaded neighboring Kuwait and by the end of the day captured its capital. The overwhelming military superiority of Saddam Hussein army left no chances. On the same day of the invasion, the United Nations Security Council passed the well-known Resolution 660, demanding the immediate withdrawal of Iraq forces and the liberation of Kuwait. Iraqi political leaders undoubtedly took advantage of the invaluable assistance and experience of Soviet military advisors to lend legitimacy to the invasion a puppet temporary government of free Kuwait was created. Without hesitation, this fake government appealed for Kuwait's incorporation into Iraq, and the country was declared its 19th province. Does this remind you of anything? Undoubtedly, the Bolsheviks, who once came up with and successfully implemented this scheme, would be proud of their followers. The UN continued to address the Kuwait issue regularly and passed resolution. By the end of 1990, a total of 12 resolutions had been adopted. Sanctions were imposed on Iraq, and a naval blockade was implemented. However, looking at the example of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we see that the mechanism of protection countries from external aggression doesn't work. The result is ineffective. That's when the United States decided to act in a way that would teach a lesson to anyone who would disregard international law and attempt to forcefully change the borders of nations. The United States led a coalition of countries known as the multinational forces. The result of their efforts was the famous Operation Desert Storm. The ground operation itself lasted only 100 hours. In those four days, the multinational forces liberated Kuwait. Although the United States formally created a large coalition of states, the driving force behind it was America. Desert Storm was the first in a series of armed conflicts between the United States and Iraq, or more specifically between the United States and Saddam Hussein ultimately leading to the removal of the Iraqi dictator. However, the United States did not act as an aggressor, violating international rules and norms. Numerous attempts to persuade Iraq to negotiate and peacefully resolve the crisis failed. 
In November 1990, the Security Council adopted another resolution regarding Iraq. This time it was an ultimatum the occupation of Kuwait must cease within one and a half months. If this didn't happen, the UN granted the multinational forces the right to conduct a military operation and liberate Kuwait from occupation. In this case, the legal basis for initiating military action against Iraq was the Security Council resolution. It was not an aggressive war, but a war for the liberation and restoration of Kuwait's independence. By the way, both before and after the Gulf War, the United States preferred to act not alone but with the support of other countries, creating international coalitions. Kuwait is liberated. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. And it was nothing that the speed, nature and results of the Gulf War are much more akin to a special military operation than to what is happening in Ukraine today. The longest war in the history of the United States lasted for 20 years. Afghanistan. A country in Central Asia has been plagued by a series of conflicts for political power since the late 1970s. As a result of the coup known as the April Revolution in 1978, a pro-Soviet socialist regime was established in the country. Attempts by the new government to implement reforms led the resistance from Islamic opposition. Thus. A civil war broke out in the country, which has been ongoing with intermittent periods of relative calm. Various nations periodically intervened in the conflict, seeing their own geopolitical interests and a platform for rivalry. The Soviet-Afghan war lasted for 10 years. The Taliban fought against the NATO military contingent and later the United States for 20 years. During the 10-year gap between those conflicts, Afghanistan became one of the most dangerous countries, a hub of global terrorism. The world changed just over 20 years ago when four hijacked planes crashed into two buildings symbolizing the economic, political and military power of the United States of America. The terrorist attacks of the 9-11-2001 remain the largest attack and its consequences are still felt today. It was after the event that the United States declared a war on terror, leading to their invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq alongside their allies. Following the 9-11 attacks, the mastermind Osama bin Laden and many members of Al-Qaeda found refuge in Afghanistan. All demands for their extradition were rejected. Leading the United States to resort to military force, the goals of the ensuing war were the overthrow the Taliban regime, establish a democratic government in Afghanistan and hold members of Al-Qaeda accountable. Less than a month later, in early October 2001, the first airstrike targeted Taliban military facilities and the military operation began. At that time, no one anticipated that it would stretch over two decades. Similar to the case of Iraq, the United States was not alone in this war. A military contingent was formed under the umbrella of NATO, the International Security Assistance Force. They operated within a framework of international law and in accordance with the resolution of the United Nations Security Council. 
However, after 10 years and the withdrawal of the NATO coalition forces, the war continued solely with the involvement of the United States. The introduction of Soviet troops into Afghanistan back then became one of the reasons for the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the end, the United States also faced setbacks there, albeit with significantly fewer losses and less catastrophic consequences than the Soviet Union two decades of fighting the Taliban. At a cost of hundreds of billions of dollars, the United States was compelled to withdraw its troops from Afghanistan in 2021, and a radical Islamic regime once again took hold in the country. In 1979, the Soviet Union did not invent any excuse but rather justified its troop deployment with a request from the government of Afghanistan and the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation, which was signed just 20 days before the invasion. By the way, the Kremlin has never been known for its creativity. Whenever they invaded a neighboring country, Moscow always came up with a corresponding request from fake and puppet government, as was the case in Finland in 1939 and the Baltic countries. In 2022, the same method was applied during the invasion of Ukraine. The cost of such requests of protection from puppet governments is not too high. Therefore, in 1979, the majority of countries worldwide, including socialist countries like China, Yugoslavia and North Korea, condemned the Soviet invasion. Yes, imagine a time when even North Korea condemned Russia. Just as Russia today blocks all initiatives regarding Ukraine at the level of Security Council, 40 years ago, the Soviet Union vetoed a resolution condemning its aggression. However, as is often the case with a resolution of this organization, beyond expressions of deep regret and concern, little progress was made. The provision calling for the withdrawal of the foreign troops from Afghanistan did not have mandatory force. Sanctions were imposed against the USSR with the most well-known manifestation being the Western countries' boycott of the 1980s Moscow Olympics. In 2011, a civil war broke out in Libya, in which NATO intervened. However, in this case, the military intervention was sanctioned by a resolution of the United Nations Security Council, aimed at protecting civilian population and classified as a humanitarian intervention. The thing is military force can be used to prevent humanitarian catastrophe or genocide against the local population by a foreign state. The concept of humanitarian intervention was applied to justify the intervention in Libya. But once again, please note that all of this took place within the framework of international law. The military operation itself lasted for eight months. Yugoslavia, spring of 1999. NATO conducted a military operation called Operation Allied Force. Military targets, airfields, bridges and factories were subjected to bombing. The reason behind this was the ethnic cleansing during the war in Kosovo. This was the first military operation conducted without direct approval from the United Nations, meaning without adoption of corresponding resolution. This sparked extensive uh, debates about the legality of NATO's action. The alliance refused to legitimize its actions throughout the UN because it rightly believed that Russia and China would veto their actions. Therefore, military actions began in April 1999 under the pretext of humanitarian intervention. The UN Charter, which prohibits the use of force without Security Council authorization except in self-defense, was ignored. 
However, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan supported NATO's actions, starting that the use of force could be justified to restore peace. Russia always opposing NATO submitted a draft resolution calling for an immediate cessation of bombings and condemning the Allies' military actions. However, the majority of Security Council member states voted against it, effectively confirming the legality of NATO's actions. In June, a resolution was adopted that retroactively sanctioned the international military presence in Yugoslavia. The cliché of why can't we do the same is an example of Russian propaganda aimed at discreditation the West, primarily the United States. Russia unleashed a full-scale war against Ukraine under the pretext of protecting the Russian-speaking population of Donbass. However, at the very least, Americans have never entertained the idea of invading another country to protect its English-speaking population from the need to learn the language of the country they are citizens of. The Vietnam War served as a vivid example that America is not exempt from learning lessons from the past. The war in Vietnam was indeed a conflict between North and South Vietnam, similar to the situation in Korea, the Soviet Union and other communist allies supported the North Vietnam, while the United States and anti-communist forces naturally stood on the opposite side. However, while the Soviet Union exercised caution and refrained from getting directly involved in full-scale military conflict on the Korean Peninsula, the United States became deeply involved in Vietnam. After losing nearly 60,000 lives and uh, with 150 wounded over the course of eight years, American troops were withdrawn from Vietnam. Those demoralized soldiers did not always understand the purpose of reasons for their involvement in that hot Asian country. The American government and society found the strength to tell the truth. They did not label defeats as a victory and did not invent euphemism to cover up their mistakes. The United States recognized that it got involved in a war that was not its own and suffered a defeat. The Vietnam War became a tremendous tragedy for both the Vietnamese and American people. Russia, like any other country, can also learn from history. It's important to acknowledge mistakes, learn from them, and strive for peaceful and diplomatic resolution of conflicts in order to prevent tragedies like the Vietnam War. By the way, speaking of the number of reasons provided by the aggressor, the justification of the war unleashed in Ukraine bears a striking resemblance to the justification for the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. For example, during the Gulf War, the reason and pretext for its start were simple a few Iraqs in action of Kuwait in 1990. But during the invasion of Iraq, more than a decade later, when the US decided to overthrow Saddam Hussein dictator regime, they came up with and voiced dozens of reasons for the attack. We all remember Colin Powell in the UN Security Council holding up a vial supposedly containing a sample of weapons of mass destruction from Iraq. It later turned out to be a fabrication. In addition to the development of banned weapons, Iraq was accused of collaborating with terrorists, particularly with Al-Qaeda. In the case of Ukraine, the aggressor country put forward more than a dozen justifications. It's enough to listen to the transcript of the Russian Security Council meeting. After the attack on Ukraine, Russian military personnel accused Ukraine of creating viruses in special bio laboratories. Moreover, those viruses were 
so intelligent that they attack only Russians. The tale of infected mosquitoes voiced by a Russian representative at the UN Security Council. We urge you to think about a very real biological threat to the population of European countries, which can be caused by the uncontrolled spread of bio I know that you expect me to re respond, but we're not going to give any more air time to the lies that you're hearing today. It's beneath this council. Are in the same category of fabrication that Russian propaganda produces in large quantities. So, coming back to the multitude of reasons and claims put forward before the start of military actions. This is usually due to the fact that the country political leadership itself cannot find sufficiently weighty justification for starting a war. Therefore, politicians resort to the language of morality and employ a strategy of cumulative reasons. Take another look at Putin's address on February 24, the year 2022. Almost all the reasons he mentioned were related to moral categories. Even the term war, invasion, annexation were deemed inappropriate. And they were discreetly covered with the euphemism special military operation. Furthermore, Russia attempts to avoid inevitable responsibility for the unleashed aggression through such rhetoric. They try to evade reparations with those uh, quasi-arguments, the leadership of the aggressor country seek to prove that they are acting within bounds of the law. Moreover, Russia's leadership uh, persistently continues to accuse the West of double standards. The Kremlin tirelessly repeats that it operates using the same method as NATO or the United States in the other countries, where the spheres of influence and interest are present. However, no euphemism or newly invented terms can blindfold the international community. The world understands that Russia unleashed an unjust aggressive war against Ukraine. Its goals include the annexation of the country, the destruction of Ukraine as a state, the denial of Ukrainians as a separate nation, and the assimilation of them with Russians. At the United Nations General Assembly, one year after the start of the war, 141 countries supported a resolution calling on Russia to immediately withdraw its troops from Ukraine. None of the military campaign conducted by United States have ever prompted the adoption of such direct, sharp and condemning resolution by the UN. Furthermore, top military and government leaders of the United States and other NATO countries have never been accused of war crimes in the International Criminal Court. As it is fashionable to say now, Russia has managed to hit rock bottom. It's an extremely rare case for the International Court in Hague to issue an arrest warrant for a head of state. Putin has become the third acting head of state whose arrest has been demanded by the court, joining the company of Muammar Gaddafi, the former leader of Libya, who for understandable reasons could not stand trial, and Omar al-Bashir, the head of Sudan, who was under arrest and his own country awaited extradition to The Hague. However, a month later, Sudan experienced another attempt to cope, and al-Bashir was transferred to a military hospital. A wonderful company for Russia's aging dictator. Although, it's unlikely that the warrant will be executed and Putin will be arrested in the near future, the mere fact of its issue speaks volumes. The world will never recognize Russia's annexation of Ukrainian territories. Russia has become a pariah state that is not accepted by the international community. 
the policy of suffocating sanctions is slowly but surely taking effect. Remember, had there ever been a case in a history where sanctions were imposed on the United States or Western countries for unleashing an aggressive war? We are unlikely to recall such an instance. There is another reason why Russia's actions category cannot be compared to those of the United States. Any war involves violence and inevitable deaths, not only military personnel, but also of civilians. However, the United States and its allies have never made and their goal to wage war against the peaceful population. No war conducted by the United States has been accompanied by the same extent of war crimes, violence, looting and terror as Russia's wars. In Ukraine, the aggressors have committed numerous war crimes, all of which well documented. Russia has chosen a position of complete denial regarding the atrocities it has committed. Those suspected of involvement and those crimes not only go unpunished, but are often openly celebrated and awarded high state honors, creating a cult around executioners and killers. Furthermore, the military actions themselves resemble a genocide of Ukrainians and the terrorizing of the civilian population. Indiscriminate bombings of residential areas and civilian objects, the obliteration of villages and cities, the forced deportation of the population, including the abduction of children from occupied territories. These are all atrocities that the Ukrainian people have had to endure. And all those crimes are committed under failed slogans of protecting the civilian population. Russia attempted to deprive Ukrainians of electricity, warmth and water during the past winter, launching massive attacks on critical infrastructure. In none of the military conflicts involving the United States has there been anything comparable. Tactical objectives may have varied, such as restoring Kuwait's independence, toppling dictatorial regimes or eliminating terrorist organizations. However, strategically and globally, the United States and its allies have always sought to establish and promote democracy. None of the military conflicts involving the United States in the 20s or 21st century have ever aimed at territorial annexation or the creation of new states. In contrast, Russia, as a true empire, cannot exist without aggressive war and conquest, a territorial expansion. The Kremlin believes that the world is divided into sphere of influence, considering the entire former Soviet Union as its own sphere. And in conclusion, a joke for those Russian patriots who continue to promote false narratives that supposedly grant America something greater than what is allowed within the framework of international law. From a conversation between two Russians. Why is America allowed to do things that we are not? Because America manages to make South Korea, while we can only have the North. See you next week. To be continued.